I would appreciate it if you, Edna, and uh, Mr. Irwin, and all you wonderfully gifted men would, would, would remain. For to me, it is truly an honor and indeed a benediction to be on the same stage with you. It would seem appropriate to say, at least for me, that I have, in your language, a tough act to follow. We lawyers are generally regarded as somewhat squarish and surely not entertaining. A perfect example of that is that when the name Earl Warren was mentioned earlier, a fine saxophonist I just learned, I thought of another Earl Warren. Nevertheless, although I may not truly understand your art, Mr. Owen, Dave, and you other gentlemen, I know what I like, and I like what I heard here tonight. I envy you gentlemen because of the beauty you are able to create and that what you create rewards you with love and friendship, whereas in my profession so frequently when I make a friend, I at the same time make an enemy. Your lawyer is most always regarded as the greatest, your champion, your opponents, a shyster. Incidentally, I'm probably the only man in the world who owns four pianos and can't find C on the keyboard. I can't play a note. Dave, I would give every material possession I own to be able to play like you. In that vein, I would like to say that in his most intimate moments and in conversations with me, Bobby always said that he regarded Dave McKenna as the finest jazz pianist in the world. I do not mean to contradict Pee Wee Irwin, who, as you recall, introduced Dave as one of the six finest jazz pianists in the world. I understand, Pee Wee, that you uh, must be more politic. Perhaps I have just broken my lawyer's oath and devoured a client's confidence, but I have said it, I believe it's true, and I'm glad I said it. How are you, Mr. Dennis? If you are wondering how I know you or you I, we have a mutual friend, Dr. Larry McCartan, who is a great fan of yours. Unfortunately, he was unable to attend, but I'm sure that he would want me to extend his best wishes to you. Last June, when we dedicated a lovely gravestone to Bobby, obtained largely due to the efforts of Jack Bradley, president of the Cape Cod Jazz Society, at that time my dear wife severely chastised me for the casualness of my attire. Not, I thought, inappropriate for Chatham and June. Tonight you will note that I am wearing a shirt and tie, but when Jack Bradley asked me if I would say a few words, I could have killed him. But in any event, I did, and so did Jack and several other friends of Bobby. And when it was all over, Jack came up to me and said, You know, it went off okay. It sounded at least like we knew what we were doing. So again tonight, although my dear wife did not have to caution me about wearing appropriate attire, she did say on the way down from Lowell, and after making a few wrong turns, you know, dear, <clears throat> you may be asked to say a few words. And so if you've noticed my back to be bent a bit, what I have prepared was written with the aid of the dashboard lights. Please don't be alarmed. I'm not unaware that brevity is the soul of wit. And besides, it's double-spaced. But nevertheless, what I have to say needs saying. I might also say that every lawyer remembers with pride the first time that he argued a case before the Supreme Court or any other appellate court. But I personally consider that this opportunity afforded me tonight to speak of my friend Bobby Hackett and to stand here with you, Edna, and you gentlemen to be the proudest moment of my professional career. And so, Edna and gentlemen of the band, friends and fans of Bobby Hackett, bear with me for a few moments. More. Over 100 years ago, in a beautiful narrative poem, The Vision of Sir Lon Fall, James Russell Lowell wrote in part, Earth gets its price for what Earth gives us. The beggar is taxed for a corner to die in. The priest hath his fee who comes and tribes us. We bargain for the graves we lie in. At the devil's booth are all things sold. Each ounce of dross costs its ounce of gold, and for a cap and bells our lives we pay, and bubbles we buy with a whole soul's tasking. I suppose that these beautiful words 
translated to the more mundane and the, and the vernacular, tell us that which we all learn at an early age, accepting that only God may be had for the asking and that no price is set on the lavish summer. We get nothing for nothing and that everything has its cost and price. It's true that in some respects, since James Russell Lowell's time, man has improved his relations with his fellow man. We no longer have alms houses, poor houses, or debtors' prisons. Nevertheless, instead of alms houses, poor houses, and debtors' prisons, do we not now have the squalling ghettos? Are not the poor and underprivileged still with us, perhaps, in many respects, poorer than before? Man collectively, through a society with his fellows, and we here tonight are representative of that society, has come to recognize the charity and the preservation of the humanities, literature, music, and all the arts is an obligation. Too long has the word charity truly been improperly defined, a misnomer, if you will, characterized and regarded as something, perhaps, as that which a man possessed of more of this world's material goods than his fellows would do because it was nice or fashionable, if at the same time not inconvenient. So for his conscience, perhaps, but not, but not obligatory. But this is wrong. Wrong. Charity is an obligation. Bobby Hackett, who we honor here tonight in such a beautiful and appropriate manner, was an immensely talented and gifted man. But even he, as great a musician as he was, would readily acknowledge that the success and recognition he achieved resulted not because of his lack of formal education in his art, but in spite of it. He was my dear friend, and I loved him, and I loved and loved his music. But he many times confided to me that he wished he had, had had the opportunity of a formal education, the opportunity to have studied and learned at, er at an early age, not that learning is not a lifetime process. Music theory and the other complexities of music, which those not so gifted take for granted. And before I forget it, Edna, Mr. Irwin, Dave, and gentlemen, I want to say that I learned a great deal from Bobby, a lot about music, and a lot about musicians. I have always loved music, just as I am sure that the same may be said by you good people here tonight. I love music, but I regarded musicians as a rather strange lot. Please understand, this was not so, hopefully because of some snobbery on my part, but because of ignorance. And upon ref reflection, I suppose, that's just as inexcusable. And for that, I apologize. I learned from Bobby that musicians are just as professional and dedicated to their profession as are members of other professions, such as law or medicine, but with far more camaraderie. I have no doubt that Bobby could have earned much more money than he did if he, if he had been willing to wear a funny costume and convert and practice the imposture of some of those more contemporary who call themselves musicians. But he was far too professional and dedicated for such nonsense. You all remember him, I'm sure, as always impeccably attired with black bow tie and tux. Being privy to some of the more intimate moments of such a great man, I can recall some amazing things. I can remember listening to Bobby practicing scales and intricate exercises while listening to Debussy's Afternoon of a Fawn or other classical musical masterpieces. Shakespeare wrote that the good that men do is oft interred with their bones. Note that he said oft, not always, and Bobby Hackett's life is the exception to that rule. The good that he has done, the beauty of his music lives on and, and enriches our lives and will continue to do so for future generations. And that good is and will be even more exalted by the good that is being done tonight in his name. That young musicians, even if only one, Edna, may be given the opportunity to, to pursue and develop their art, an opportunity that might not be otherwise afforded them. <laughs>